So we were talking a little bit before this about your team and how they're from all over the world. Um, you have a very diverse team, but you have some Hong Kong people and you have some Chinese people. So um, I'd like to dig a little bit into like how do you hire people? Like how do you decide who's going to come on your team? What's that process like? And then also um, one of the things I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs here is in China, talent moves quickly, right? So it's people are apt to leave if they find a higher salary or something like that. So one, how do you bring your people on? And then two, how do you retain them? Uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful question. And again, when we talk about China, I want to once again stress and highlight that uh, labor market in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, in Chongqing, and in Harbin are completely different. So if you want to hire somebody who is never going to leave you, go to places like Shandong, go to places like Tianjin, go to places like, again, Harbin. Uh, Beijing is uh, dependent on the sector, but basically, if you go to places like Shanghai, people are going to, like, you pay, he pays me $300 more, I'm going to move, right? Um, Hong Kong, again, it depends on the industry. Mm, how do I hire staff? I'm very, very fortunate to, to have been able to establish a system which allows me to hire people that actually stays with me. I've been interviewed um, since I think three or four years ago by a local uh, Economic Times, Hong Kong Economic Times, exactly on that topic. And it was so funny, at that time it was such a small potato, you know, just basically having five people in my team. And then this huge local newspaper, you know, Hong Kong Economic Times comes and says, you need to tell us how do you retain your young staff. Because Hong Kong also has this problem that people come straight from school and half a year later they're gone. And for me they saw that, okay, for two years or a year and a half, that same team that started, they keep working in this little company. So there must be something she does right, right? And um, that time I told them about this, uh, this system that I have, that I invented, and they were like, wow, that's amazing, that's revolutionary, let's, let's apply it, you know, in, in Hong Kong. So. Um, I have adapted it a bit but haven't changed. So first of all, uh, we send out um, uh, job descriptions, right? So if I'm hiring designer, I might use platform A. If I'm hiring content manager, I might use uh, content B. Uh, in Hong Kong in particular, if I hire uh, locals, I go to JobsDB. Um, if I hire mainland Chinese, I go to places like Gong Piao Quan. So there is a WeChat account that specifically uh, pushes job advertising to mainland Chinese that live in Hong Kong and want to work in Hong Kong. So you need to go to a specialized platform that will work so much better. Secondly, uh, we receive their uh, applications and previously it used to be myself, right now I have uh, people, we give them a call and uh, we just want to check whether this is a normal human being. It, it is usually a three to five minute call uh, usually we call in the morning if the person sleeps at you know if you call them at 10 a.m. and he's still sleeping that's probably not the person who is serious about looking for a job but basically just just to make sure that they speak the language that they are normal human beings I can ask them questions like tell me about yourself your hobbies why you are looking for this job etc etc very quick if they are okay then we uh, send them a task so you prepare a task which about uh, which takes about two hours to complete for instance, if you are a designer, I would ask you to design something that I need for my projects right now. If you are a copywriter, I would ask you to write me an article on WeChat or uh, a tweet on Weibo for a specific client. And uh, we give them 20, 24 hours to get back to us. Um, out of all the people we send a task to, about 40% get back to us. 40 to 30. We receive the task and those people that don't get back to us, we are not interested in. They don't have, they're not excited about the job. They don't have what it takes. They don't have the attitude. And attitude is the most important thing. So with those people that send us uh, their tasks, unless they are completely horrible and didn't put any effort, we, we invite them for the trial day. So um, what is a trial day? A trial day is just a normal day at work when they come in from nine to six and they spend the whole day in the office working on the projects that we have right now. It is an opportunity for us not to just see one task or to spend 20 minutes talking to them and interviewing them about stuff. It's an opportunity for us to see how do they show up at work? Do they fit the team? Um, can they do stuff that we need them to do? And it is an opportunity for them to figure out, is this the company where I want to work with? Do I like the boss? Do I like the colleagues? Is this the atmosphere? What kind of clients do we have? Uh, my team will take them out for lunch. So without me, they will have an opportunity to talk. They can talk about me. They are usually very interested. So is she like a bad boss? Is she a good boss? They can gossip about me, which is fine. They need to, you know, to bond 
uh, to bond together and um, uh, usually I also have about 20 minutes chat with them during that day which is like casual interview so we speak um, then they leave second day in the morning we have a debrief with my team so my team gives me feedback do they feel that this person can do the job would they want them on their specific team uh, do they do they feel that these people stand for our company values um, if yes uh, if all is good, if it's fantastic feedback, I'm going to give them a call, I'm going to speak with them in more detail and we are going to give a job offer. If not, we're going to call them back and say thank you very much, we really appreciate it, but at this stage it's not for us. So with this process, uh, it's much more difficult to make a mistake. Have I ever done a mis made a mistake? Yes, but it's much less likely to occur. And in terms of, um, uh, you know, how to hire people outside of Hong Kong and what, what was your question again? No, so, so it's hiring and then also retaining. Retaining, yeah. So in terms of retaining, uh, my company is very straightforward, very open. Um, they know how much money we make. They know how much money, like, we spend. We have graphs hanging in our office. And uh, they know, it, it's very transparent. I believe they need to know. They need to know whether we're doing well or not. They need to know what is important, what's not. All the communication is very open in the office. I give open feedback. Besides that, we also do disk profile. Uh, to all our people here that are listening, I recommend to do that. No matter, no matter whether you have existing team or you're hiring new people, it's called D-I-S-C, yeah. yeah, disk profile. Um, you understand how different people communicate with each other. So. Um, when you practice it, it becomes a part of the culture. So we practice that. Um, um, I bring them, I believe that we have a fantastic um, office environment. We've got cool rules. Most of the people say they love to work, uh, you know, in my company because of the other people, because they feel that the best friends are there, right there with them. We have fruits in the office, we have lunches together, we have uh, bowling, we have painting classes, we've got this painting stuff hanging everywhere. We go on holidays once a year all together, company sponsors. So you need to provide all that because I enjoy it. I don't want, when I was setting up my company, I didn't want to just work for another company which is now mine. I wanted to work with people that I like. So. Um, if I feel comfortable there, if I want to play music in the office, I want to, I do that and people enjoy that. Besides that, mainland Chinese, Hong Kongers, they enjoy international environment. So I've got people from Canada, I've got people from Russia working for me, I've got people from Hong Kong, from China. We've got interns sometimes from Australia, sometimes from the UK, sometimes from the US. We had a girl from Nigeria coming in for three months. So they really love that it's an international kind of, you know, melting pot and they are part of something very important. And another thing is, People are not motivated just by money. That's such a misconception that a lot of business owners still have and hold close to their heart. Money is important, don't get me wrong. Uh, you need to pay well. But at the same time, it's all about, people need to know where the company is going. What is the, what is the long-term goal? What is the long-term vision? That's why for me, I tell them how much money we make. I tell them what, where I'm going and I don't know in the beginning of 2018 where we're going to be in 2019 but I tell them every three months or every two months we have workshops and I tell them that's where we're going oh we need to change course that's why that's how are you on board with that let's see how to make it better so you need to give them this feeling that they are part of something much bigger than themselves and they need to know what is my part you know a lot of businesses that I see especially in service industry everybody's doing everything which is great in our startup also you know a lot of people doing things I do I multitask as well but you need to know what is your core thing what is the thing that you own you have ownership of um, if they know that and if they know the bigger picture and if they are appreciated and if they are having fun they would not want to live um, so a few pieces here um, I'd like to dig into language culture and then being on the ground right so you've been in, in China you've been in Hong Kong um, you've learned Chinese, how, how good is your Chinese? Like, Fei Chang Hao. Fei Chang Hao, okay. Um, and so in terms of understanding the culture, being able to speak the language, um, and spending actual time on the ground, how important do you think those things are for actually becoming successful? Crucial, that's it. You don't speak Chinese, you want to do business in China, you need to have a Chinese wife, and she's gonna be your safe life whatever whatever this but it's just it's impossible it's impossible to be an outsider and be extremely successful in this market unless you are an expat and you're coming for an assignment for three years um, 
learning the language is paramount important because you understand the culture, you understand the way people think. It's all in the language. My, my husband is German, so I actually went on and I studied German. I learned German language in order to communicate with his grandmother and in order to watch local movies and in order to understand how close this language is to Russian, for example, and how, how much we actually have in common. I wouldn't be able to understand that if I couldn't speak that language. So the same with China. You work, you live in that country, you need to respect it. And your first gesture of respect is learn the language. There's no excuse. Chinese is a very simple, easy language to learn. It's, that's why it's called simplified Chinese, it's Pu Tong Hua, Pu Tong Zhen, it was created for simple people. Um, it's different from the rest of the world, but it's not difficult. Yeah, so grammar is super simple, right? Um, it, it's, just, it, it's just basically trying not to link it to your Latin languages, but detaching it and studying it. So language is absolutely important. And in terms of learning culture and history and going deeper, it's a must. If you respect, if you, if you want to link your life, professional career and your success with this country, whatever it may be, be it Mozambique or be it China, you must dig deeper. And what a lot of foreigners, for me, that's a sign of arrogance. They come and they feel that they're either better or they know better or they're just here for a while or they are going to come to that market and they're going to teach them all how to do stuff. That's, that's just arrogant. You come, you learn and then you take the best and you use it and if you can bring something to the table if you want to add more value you need to build on a very strong foundation which is language culture and being on the ground for me as well i live in hong kong and that's that's what a lot of people tell me oh but you're not in china excuse me i go to china three times a month i go to china yes i'm not in china but this is by choice shenzhen is 40 minutes away from hong kong i've, I've got china in my office for me it is a lifestyle choice but I'm not sitting in Singapore or in Switzerland or in the US and telling you about China. Um, it's a lifestyle choice. And even that, and even that, me being in Hong Kong, I also at times feel detached because of the speed with which China is moving. I might know what's happening in Shanghai or in Shenzhen, but what's happening in Chongqing, what's happening in Xinjiang, what's happening in, uh, you know, Guiding, I've got no idea because I haven't, I'm not traveling there often enough to be on top of my game there. So that is why I have a team I task them to give me updates. I've got like weekly, uh, every Monday morning we have weekly updates. I, you know, read that stuff, my team reads that stuff. And before I present, before I, you know, go deep into a specific topic, I again ask them to go and bring me all this information. When needed, I just fly to Zhejiang. I just fly somewhere. I speak with people there. I've got the network to be able to access it. But even again, being in Hong Kong, at times it's difficult. So being on the ground is paramount importance. has obviously been booming for a while um, and it seems like some people would say you know like things are slowing down now and things are getting more difficult whether it's regulations or whatever um, what would you say are still some of the untapped opportunities that exist in China anything and everything in third and fourth tier cities it depends on the third tier city you go there you go there you spend time there you live there and you figure out you can be a very successful uh, bubble tea seller. You can be a very successful beauty salon. You can be a very successful digital company. You can be a very successful teaching uh, center. But it is really third and fourth tier cities, up and coming middle class, lower middle class, that is going to be the next fuel of China. In terms of China slowing down, yes and no. It's slowing down in markets like Shanghai, or Guangzhou, or Beijing. If you want to place your product on shelves of supermarkets in places like Shanghai, you are paying 70 to 80% of your retail price to supermarkets because so many, so many international brands want to be placed there. You're losing money by being there in supermarkets very often if it's your first entry. That's never happening anywhere, even in Hong Kong. With you know, retail prices being crazy. It's not happening uh, anywhere else in the world, but because it's such an over-supplied um, uh, market, right? There's so much competition, and of course, you're coming as a newcomer, you need to have multi-million dollar marketing and promotional budgets to be able to gain any attention. People are tired, they're bombarded with those messages anywhere and everywhere, uh, and unless you have something extremely uh, interesting and different, nobody cares. 
and even if you have that uh, you know catch idea we spoke about it earlier you have uh, your Billy Billy uh, channel right and you can catch the wave you can catch the wave and you can start selling your you remember those lavender teddy bears do you remember the story of Levin the teddy from bear Australia, from right? Australia? Yeah. Exactly. So how they are like, super, super big, and suddenly twenty thousand bears are being ordered on Taobao. So you can capture that wave, but then from one day to the next, somebody else starts manufacturing. Oh, it's not fashionable anymore, and you lose it. So that's what's happening in highly developed, sophisticated, big first and second tier markets in China, and it is brutal. And you need to be ready for that and you need to have deep pockets and you need to be prepared and you can be very successful at one point up until the time when you're not second and third uh, third and fourth tier cities are different but it takes more work more time and um, a better understanding on the ground and that's what people that are currently working in china are probably not doing enough they want to cash out more in first year cities without going to those because it's more difficult it's complicated not quite sure what's going on not so much money to make right now but what's gonna happen in two years we're starting from scratch today without the guanxi that you have without the experience that you have what advice would you have for yourself or someone in that position if i was starting right now moving with chinese language or without let's say without without chinese language i would probably be so scared of China I wouldn't make that jump uh, because right now China is in the news all the time because everybody is somehow one way or another aware how complicated it is so I would probably be so scared and paranoid and brainstorm brainwashed by the mainstream media that it's scary and wow impossible to succeed that I wouldn't make a jump it is still possible to succeed it's not an easy journey the best thing that you, the best gift you can give yourself right now is at a young age or whatever age you are as long as you are below 70 you are at a young age because our technology is developing and we're gonna live at least to 100 120 years old in our lifetime so we've got enough to go so if you are below 70 move to China Shenzhen I would say for a year and that's what I would have done I would have figured out when I'm there, what do I want to do? I would have picked up my language, I would have grown my guanxi, I would have observed what's happening, what's needed. And once I understood all that, I would have probably moved to a third tier city to start something up. Or alternatively, I would have come up with a, a digital product that I could just you know, play with, take somebody's money, play, you know, they pay me for an MBA and i will have to would have to work extremely hard for a year two three uh, try to make it work if it works fantastic if not i would have moved on uh, to do something else i wouldn't have gone back to corporate world or uh, working for somebody else because being an entrepreneur is just a completely different level of um, freedom and liberation and fun and growth and this is what happiness is in my view so ha growth is happiness if you keep growing you know you're developing and you're happy so china provides those opportunities for growth almost unlimited and in order to facilitate that i would have moved to shenzhen uh, spend a year there did all those things and then um, planned out what to do next so you're in the area of marketing um, and i wanted to sort of get your perspective on how is marketing to China or marketing to Chinese different than marketing in the West? Whether it's platforms or culturally or any of that stuff. Well, um, everything is different. To start with, uh, the environment is different, right? Digital environment, offline environment, media environment, whatever you touch, TV environment. I mean, uh, regulations, right? So in terms of social media, all the platforms are different. Most of the Western platforms are obviously blocked and China has more than 60 unique platforms. Uh, every two weeks we have something new popping up. Um, they are also very specialized. You can find a platform for gamers. You can find a platform for mothers with newborn babies. You can find a platform for you know, tree lovers and greenery lovers or whatever, garden lovers. You, you have all that in mainland China very very successfully so um, then media is different I mean nowhere else in the world you pay journalists for media features in China you pay transportation fees 
and this is the way industry works so if you are coming with your you know western uh, ideals that you know media is free and it's all about you know it's all about the good story and angle you will be very disappointed um, regulations are changing swiftly and you need to stay on top of what's going on there what is the next five year plan what is the um, important five uh, development areas for the government what are they pushing for how can i be uh, they're positioned to help them reach their goal in five years so 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 important and this is not spoken much about maybe because people feel uh, that's not nice to talk about communist party plus it's fantastic to talk about it they are extremely smart people it's like McKinsey is running China and uh, you know you like it or not they are a very successful economy they are making a lot of smart choices right decisions and you need to be on top of what is their policy for the next five years if you are planning to work in that market. Um, so, yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes have those, you know, flashes that I would talk about. So, I love the tangents. The tangents yeah, it just goes, goes. Um, specifically for marketing. Right. People are trying to market to a Chinese audience, and that doesn't necessarily have to be in China. It could be, for example, now there's a lot of tourists leaving of China. Of course, right? of course. How do, people, how do people in the West get Chinese people's attention? Right. So to get Chinese people's attention, you need to be bringing their technology to your offline place. For example, Japan last year, if I'm not mistaken, increased the number of WeChat payments, if I'm not mistaken, by 70 times, times in one year. So small coffee shops, uh, department stores, hotels are accepting WeChat Pay. So you need to bring their technology, you need to make it e easy and seamless for them to pay. You need to be on uh, Chinese, so this convenience is very high on the list of Chinese tourists and basically Chinese consumers. Um, number two, you need to be on Chinese social media, but that depends on the sector. Sometimes we have B2B companies coming in and say, we need a WeChat account, and my question is why? Why do you need a WeChat account? Or a hotel comes and says, we need a WeChat account. Maybe you don't need a WeChat account. Maybe you want bloggers on Weibo or live streaming platforms to just get awareness because WeChat is not good for awareness. So you need to be on the right social media, at least one digital platform in China where you dominate or where you are uh, for you for yourself yeah for you for your China sort of hashtag you dominate that space um, you need to be constantly learning you need to be working with bloggers or other influencers uh, the most important I think um, success factor is you need to have the right partner you need to have the right partner so many people try to do it by themselves so many companies try to do it by themselves sometimes they hire a team in China Sometimes they hire an intern who speaks Chinese and they try to do it by themselves, depending on the budget. Sometimes they just hire a freelancer who is a Chinese student trying to do some stuff. Um, you need to understand that China market is moving so fast. To be in marketing uh, means you need to constantly learn. I cannot be a marketing expert um, f from three months from now if I don't keep learning. I cannot. I cannot call myself a marketing expert in China if I'm not learning on a daily, weekly basis and I push my team to give me that stuff and I go and I explore and I push myself to do that because it just changes so fast, much faster than in the rest of the world. So that's number one. Number two, if you hire a marketing team and they're just sitting there enjoying, in three, year, in three months, in six months, they're going to be irrelevant. They will not understand uh, what's going on and they will be basically left behind. Any internal team does that because there's not enough push. Um, secondly, if you hire a person that is, um, you, you know, is writing well or speaking well or uh, is experienced somehow in marketing, usually it will be so difficult to capture that person because all the agencies are trying to grab them and uh, they will pay much higher fees and salaries. So you cannot hire, you can either hire a marketing, uh, the person who knows marketing from the West but doesn't know China, or you can hire a person who knows China, who knows how to write in Chinese, but is not a marketing professional. Most of the cases, most of the times that's the case. So you need, you need um, an agency, you need uh, an advisor, you need um, a network, you need somebody who brings you that small uh, company somewhere in uh, Shandong and says, you know what, these guys are young, good, but they are working, they know that you know, they can handle your stuff. You need somebody to do that. Uh, you need to have that trust. 
um, and uh, there are tons and tons of options so finding the right partner is absolutely crucial um, uh, especially if you're not located in China yourself and if you are located in China you have your team make sure that you keep training them just make sure that you keep training them that they are on point push them because there's no such thing as an expert in China you're always learning and you're always looking up to the market and Chinese consumers as you say please teach me please teach me please show me the way and of course you need to have a lot a lot of respect to the Chinese consumers they are not just buying what you are pushing they are teaching you how to serve them better and for that you need to thank them and for that you need to um, innovate and adapt and uh, that is what a lot of Chinese companies are doing so beautifully and that's what we need to learn in the West to do as well adapt and listen and learn and bring it to the market fast cheap and um, and um, and fantastic quality so if people are looking to find more of your work, whether it's to read your book, um, to listen to your videos, to check out your materials, to contact you, to reach out, to maybe work with you, what's the best place online to find you? LinkedIn is my most loved social media platform. I'm on LinkedIn and Ashley Galina Dudarinok. Um, I've got a YouTube channel called Ashley Talks China. My book is on Amazon. It's called Unlocking the World's Largest E-Market. Um, so I'm sure you're going to put links below so guys connect. LinkedIn is my favorite platform and uh, I can be reached via email as well at ashley at chozan.co. It's been an absolute pleasure, Ashley. Thank Beyond. you so much. I'm a hugger. <laughs> Thank you. That's the first hug I love. Oh, I'm a hugger. I'm a hugger. I love it.